Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Muse. Welcome to the Open Studios Tour Roanoke Artist Interviews 2023. Um, I am gonna be running around and um, interviewing the host site's um, artist and possibly the planning committee and, um, and bringing it to you live so that we can get you inspired to come on the tour. So I am here with Annie Waldrop, who is a painter, sculptor, what would you call yourself? Multimedia artist. Multimedia artist. There we are. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about you. Um, or do you just go by Annie Waldrip? Uh, do you have a website? Do you have uh, ways yeah. to find you? Um, yeah, I ha there is a website which needs to be updated. Like it seems like every other artist's website needs to be updated too. So, uh, But it's AnnieWaldrip.net and um, I am always posting things under my um, original name Ann Waldrop on Facebook as well that's sort of like where as I finish the paintings that's the first place I go and um, so yeah that's where you can find me online so most updated is there yeah is on Facebook yeah so, um, so tell me a little bit about Annie um, what's your background what um, you know what inspired you to become an artist uh, I've <laughs> had that question asked me before but it's I told the last person that asked me that question, I said, well, I didn't really have a choice. You know, I kind of came out of the womb that way. And um, so I guess early signs of being an artist were things like, you know, I wanted to paint my room chartreuse when I was a teenager. Um, I was always attracted to flea markets at a young age. And just, you know, all signs were pointing in this direction from, you know, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So then in high school I took my, believe it or not, I didn't really take an art class until high school, but I was hooked then and uh, then and so I went to Mary Baldwin for a year and I had a lot of support there. I really was interested in going to New York. So I went off to, um, to Parsons. I got accepted at Parsons School of Design and that changed my life completely. It was so exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. So did you have a workshop or a teacher that was, uh, that you would consider a mentor or someone who inspired you to do what you do now? Well, actually, um, I, when I was at Parsons, my major there was graphic design and then I started designing hats. But what really, after I, after I left Parsons, I designed hats for a while because I always had this sort of background interest in, in fashion and sort of sculptural things and a lot of designers started their careers designing hats but while I was doing that I was part of a downtown art scene in New York City and uh, met Jean-Michel Basquiat the painter and would go to the Mud Club which is now actually a famous it's we didn't realize it when we were there but we were kind of like <laughs> making history uh, you know who else was the guy um, you know um, I'm blanking it. Keith Haring went there, Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, Madonna, Cindy Lauper, uh, Bowie was there. I mean, the Mud Club was the downtown bohemian answer to Studio 54, and it was really a creative enclave. And the guy that was actually the doorman there has re recently written a book about the Mud Club, um, and I'm glad he did because it's really now part of that New York 80s history where you know the art scene up there really exploded people had money and and Basquiat just kind of blew everybody away and it was just really fun to see that evolution and live live be a part of that what was why was it named the mud club uh, that's an interesting question uh, mud <laughs> you know, part of the punk thing was always a little macabre kind of and dark humor and I believe Dr. Mudd was the guy who worked on John Wilkes Booth or Abraham Lincoln. Well, he had something to do with that situation, so it was kind of making fun of a piece of history, Southern history, because the guy who actually, I, I read this in the book, the guy who owned the Mud Club was Southern, and which actually kind of makes sense to me because it was just like this, you know, party at the Mud Club ongoing. And so he was like a great host, like, you know, how, you know, Southern, Southern, uh, you know, politeness or whatever, the way Southerners entertain all the time. And it was just kind of like that. It was, it was really fun. In the heart of New York. Yeah, downtown, 
downtown. The building itself is totally nondescript. It was nothing glamorous like Studio 54, but what really made it great was they had, uh, Anita Sarko was the DJ there and she's since deceased, but she had great taste in music and she knew everybody would hit the dance floor and you know she knew how to rev it all up. And uh, like I remember th them playing uh, um, Secret Agent Man and and then they would just go into Sex Machine and everybody would just freak out, you know, and just, <laughs> and by James Brown, you know, and just go completely crazy. So, and we would go upstairs and one night when I was there, Joni Mitchell walked by. Well, that just about killed me. I mean, I was like, oh my God, and Tiny Tim. I mean, all these people would like pull up in limousines in front of the Mud Club at about two o'clock in the morning. And I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> so, is that what's, is that one of the reasons that you're inspired by these singers, actors, uh, amazing people that, that now you want to do their portraits? Kind of. I mean, they, you know, I started, I started to think, you know, fast forward millions of years from New York City, but first of all, you know, it's just the way I am. It's kind of like no accident that I found that place. I mean, it was very, it very much molded me that, that, and also the access to museums in New York all the time even more than the education, I mean, Parsons' education was great, but this was like, you know, the real experiences of my life that shaped me. And so it sort of, you know, taught me how to be creative and, and be an artist. But back to the uh, famous people, um, I guess uh, part of my Dharma practice is, like I was saying earlier, that we are all seeds of potential. And really, uh, a lot of the people that I'm painting, there's some, there's some thread of connection there that inspired me on some level, whether it be a musician, an actor, or a creative person. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm sort of paying homage to the people that have made me who I am, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Are there any non-famous people that you've paid homage to in a painting? <laughs> uh, well, of course. I mean, I'm trying to think who, what do you, is there somebody who's inspired you that you wouldn't say was necessarily famous, but that well, is somebody who has molded, helped mold who you well, are Well, I mean, well? this is, this is Roanoke history and this would be interesting. Yeah. Of course, there's always Ann Glover who was a little bit older than I was. And so, you know, I was always a devotee, <laughs> but, um, and she's on the tour. Yes. And, uh, but Ann's best friend, and actually, as it turned out, we had this, Ann and I have lots and lots of connections going way back but one of them is and it was i was just talking about this earlier today to another friend a, a guy named danny boone who is not with us anymore uh, this would be lynn boone's brother lynn boone being the realtor um danny was uh is it was my brother's age he's he would have been 74. uh danny was danny was the first real artist i knew so even prior to new york city it was it was all about danny and danny one of the things Danny did, which really impressed me, because I was just a little punk, about eight years old. He was about eight years older than I was, but he built a studio in his backyard. He turned a tool shed into a studio. And of course, I'd never seen an artist's studio before. And uh, we would go down there and his mother had made all these cushions. She put ticking all over the cushions and he had this giant poster of Theta Barra on the wall. Um, and he, he was going to Patrick Henry. He was uh, one of the editors of Quill Magazine, which was sort of like the precursor to, to Artemis. It was kind of like that, you know. The, yeah. And um, he was just so multi-talented and I just gravitated to him and was very inspired by him, very much so. And so between that and then another Open Studios person is Nan Mahone. And, Nan had a cousin who was living in New York, and when I was 17, I went up there and stayed with Nan's cousin, Jane Granis, in her studio loft apartment, which of course, you know, for somebody, a, a teenager, this just was like, I'd never seen anything like this. And there were, there was a skylight, and her husband was a sculptor, and he had all these sculptures around their apartment, which was next to this great restaurant, which was called The Ear Inn. Oh, Lord. Sorry about that. <laughs> called the Ear Inn. And the reason it was called the Ear Inn was because the part of the word bar had burned out on the B and it looked like an E. And so they they dubbed it the Ear Inn. And when you, it was so cute. And when you went in there, you could um, draw on the, they, it was the first restaurant I'd ever been in. They put 
uh, they put this drawing paper over all of their tables and crayons on each table so you could be an artist while you were sitting in there eating. And of course, that also just was, you know, the coolest thing I ever heard of at that point. And, you know, it was just thrilling. Absolutely. So is that one of the reasons you decided you wanted to go to Parsons or that you wanted to go to New York? That yeah, that, that trip, that yeah. trip was kind of the precursor and I was just sold. <laughs> and there were other things too. I, the other one was down here, and I'm, I've mentioned this before too, but um, in terms of going to Parsons and being sort of interested in design, um, Sydney's, remember the store Sydney's? Yeah, <laughs> Sydney used to um, carry Bessie Johnson's first line of clothing, mm -hmm. Alley Cat. Mm -hmm. And looking back on it too, she's another person, I'm, I'm gonna paint her, I've got to, she, I love her. But the thing was, was, you know, it was this, the, I was obsessed with these clothes. And w looking back on it too, she really was a person who was sort of like a painter that became a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. And her early work, like very colorful and, um, you know, she, you could tell an artist that became a designer. I mean, some designers are in it for the money, but hers was just so expressive, especially that early work. And I was very, very, as to this day, I, I think it was great. Yeah, it was cutting edge at the time. It really, really was. And and the fact that we got it down here in Roanoke yeah. was just, you know, thrilling to me. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so you're originally from Roanoke? Yeah. Okay. So you were born and raised here, but then you trotted off to New York to get your city life in. Yeah, I was there for 12 <laughs> years, had no regrets and no desire to do it over again either. <laughs> <laughs> so what brought you back here? Um, well, let's see what happened. Um, there were a, there was a lot going on in New York that got kind of dicey. Um, after a while, uh, it was you know I was there through the AIDS epidemic and I lost a lot of people and so things that it was sort of like the party was over. Yeah. And uh, so then I decided that I just sort of needed a reprieve and came back. You know, there are lots of little enclaves of the story. But anyway, I came back to Virginia and basically started teaching. And that was not, it, it took me a long time to kind of detox from New York City. It was very yeah. hard. It was like re-entry into a different world because mm, the things that matter in New York, they're just, everybody has different sort of priorities in a city, you know, urban life that sort of just, I don't know, trying to, everybody in New York is always sort of, it's kind of, it is me, me, me. I mean, Seinfeld had that one really right, but <laughs> um, it's just, so it's different down here. So it took me a long time to sort of get over that. But teaching had its, I'm glad I'm not teaching anymore, but teaching had its um, place in my development because I became sort of a jack of all trades through teaching because I taught photography, I taught art, I taught painting, I taught sculpture, and you know, in teach, I even had to teach a ceramics class one time, and I'm like, oh my God, I know nothing about this. But, you know, I do, in that I had the, you know, design sensibility and everything, but, and again, back to technology, you know, basically these days, even if you haven't had it in school, if you just tutorial it, you'll learn. So, mm -hmm. you know, I did all of that. So a lot of things have run through my hands, mm -hmm. you know. That's fantastic. So what are you known for now? <laughs> That's a good question too. Um, you know, I, I, I had been looking for my voice for a very long time and I had, it was been kind of a difficult process for me because who knows, I probably have ADHD, but aside from that, um, an interest in so many things. I mean, I still am interested in graphic design. I, I love fashion. And of course, I spent a lot of time in museums looking at paintings and sculpture. And so um, the task now has been to figure out what really matters to me. But I feel like I finally sort of made some decisions about, about that. And it was sort of like we were talking right when you came over. I've been sort of honing it down to these portraits for now. And I'm really excited because in doing that, I can really focus on not just what I'm painting, but how I'm painting what I'm painting. And I think something that a lot of artists, you know, are looking for is that style. And so, I mean, I, I put it closely related to a, a singer who is trying to find their voice as a singer, 
So an artist needs a voice too, you know, through their style. Like you, when I think of Alex Katz, it's sort of, he has sort of a minimalist style or, um, you know, Fairfield Porter or, you know, Grant Wood, whoever they are, you look at that person and you know, oh yeah, that looks like a painting by such and such and so and so. And that takes a lot of just, you just have to keep doing it until it's an organic process. Yeah. And I, you can't predict it but I feel like I'm closer to it than I ever have been, which is kind of exciting for me. That is, that is. So can you talk to me a little bit about what your process is? Do, um, do you have anything that we can see or would you like to just talk about it here? Do you wanna? Well, I can talk about it here and then um, I'll, I'll take you upstairs for a minute. I will. Okay. But um, so actually the artist statement is where things really start, which I love that because um, I wrote an artist statement about five or six years ago, and I have a friend who, I, I cannot lie, I have a friend who's an art historian, and I ran it past her. I wasn't going to, she said she would look at it, I said, okay. <laughs> and she went to UVA, and she's really smart, and so I had her look at it, and um, basically it, it stayed the way I wrote it, but she made a few edits and helped me get it, you know, really, so, so I liked it. And uh, one of the things in the artist statement that I talked about was that I was very, when I came back to Roanoke, I started going to this Dharma Center and I love the concepts. A lot of the concepts that I learned uh, through that spiritual practice resonated with me on a lot of levels. And I kept thinking, well, you know, I could integrate some of these teachings into my art practice. And uh, Buddhism is very much about um, the other, you know, focusing on the other. And so it sort of was this, again, an organic process of, well, you know, that's kind of cool because uh, seeds of potential and how much I've been influenced by all these other people. And so it just kind of like, again, carved its way down to, you know, portraits really do sort of fit the bill for what I had written in my artist statement about five years ago. And it's just all sort of come together by now. Falling into place. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Okay, well then let's go see your studio. Okay. Oh, wow. So you can, yeah, you can actually see in here. So what I was trying to do here was uh, in integrate um, painting and sculpture. And that's one of the reasons I landed on books. And then we mentioned seeds of potential and biographies. And so it's a theme that the title of this book is um, Sophie's Evolution. And actually one of the reasons that I like doing the books too is because I mentioned I had studied graphic design at Parsons and a book gives me the latitude to do a painting, get into graphic design, also fashion. I mean, it sort of encompasses you know, it's a way for me to um, sort of, you know, get all my interests in one place. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I did another book called Sophie's Evolution, and this is my second, I've revisited it, but some sometimes I get started on stuff and just put it away for a little while. Now, do you do yet. pages inside or? I'm going to, going one to, of the uh -huh. things. Um, so this is still in progress. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. see this though. Yeah. One of the other things that I really, so the idea was to take canvases mm -hmm. and make them the front and the back cover of books. So then you get into, and you know, there are other pieces in, mm -hmm. that I have done. Um, so then I have to fill the pages inside the book. So I'm, I'm dealing with another graphic design thing inside of a book, which is, you don't see it here because I haven't finished it, but layout, you know, all these things are things that I have studied in school and, you know, it's time to sort of bring all these different interests and everything to fruition in a more, you know, organized way. That makes sense. That's awesome. And I can say too, I have all these really nice friends. Uh, my friend, Judy Arkell, whose husband Ross uh, mm. died recently. She has been so generous. She gave me a ton of paint. I couldn't be painting the portraits that I'm painting now because I probably couldn't afford the paint, but she has mm. given me enough paint for me to paint for the rest of my life. <laughs> she gave it to me. I love it. So, um, 
what um so where does experimentation come into play i guess experimentation for you is always well yeah <laughs> yes and no i mean i'm tightening up on my um on my process right now and I've had many, 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 many years of experimentation. I mean, I don't mean to sound like I go at everything and it's totally predetermined because it isn't. But on the other hand, mm, my direction is a lot, I still want to leave room for some experimentation, but right now I'm sort of at a stage of like trying to hold it together with like one or two ideas and not jump ship so, so much, you know? Yeah. So what lets you up, is is there, do you find that you're more lit up by doing more 3D, like this book here, or with some of the portraiture that you're doing now? Well, uh, there's nothing like an object, and my mother was a collector of objects. I grew up around that, and that's sort of what led me down that path. And there's some sculptors that I really, really love, like Martin Purrier. But... My work is not like his at all, but that's okay. <laughs> but um, really, just from the practical point of view of expenses and everything else, a painting is just a lot easier. When you get into, I love the product of 3D, but sometimes just dealing with the the wood, the, the nails, the drills, and the this and the that, and the weight, and the storage, it's just, I'm finding, I sort of put it on hold for a little while to just get these paintings out without questioning it for a little, for just a little while. They take a little bit less space. Yeah, <laughs> and they're lighter to transport. I just had the show at Mary Baldwin and I had to pay for a box truck to move it all up there and come home. And I'm like, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So will we be able to see some of those pieces or are we going to go look at some yeah. portraiture? Yeah, well both. Can both. We both? Absolutely. A whole other series of work where I made environments. We pulled down some white backdrop paper and I made environments back here and I started photographing the environments and I'm going to go come back to it. But as you can see, it's just sculpture is just a whole nother animal in terms of storing Actually, some of these could actually probably go in my house again. I need to come out here and get what I can put on the walls in there and do it, you know, before the, before. Before the tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. So be excited, everyone. You'll get to see some of this stuff in action. <laughs> yeah. And so here's just a little glimpse of what's to come for Urban Studios. And also, a lot of these pieces you can see on my website or, you know, on prior Facebook, you know, um, posts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now we're in storage. Okay, so tell me about some of your portraiture. Um, I started, I started with musicians and one of the reasons I started with musicians is because even though I am a visual artist, um, the Musicians have been sort of like the sound. I know a lot of baby boomers can identify with this, but it's sort of like the soundtrack of my life. And I have two brothers and they come over and we sit after dinner and either listen to jazz or listen to, you know, contemporary music, music that goes, I say contemporary, we're not really contemporary anymore, but <laughs> so um, that, that was a big inspiration. And the portrait of Billie Holiday, which I did this is my second attempt at Billie Holiday. She just strikes me as, first of all, a fabulous singer, and she's a person who had a lot of pain in her life, and I feel like her art was driven by the release of the pain. So the contradiction between the beauty and the pain. And of course, that is Vivian Lee that you're looking at right now. And I don't know if, everybody, if people know this about her, but sadly, as beautiful as she was, she had she was bipolar and so that's another thing i just people are complex and again i like to i like to read biographies and find out what really happened in their lives 
And of course, Lou Reed is the quintessential New Yorker. I mean, you know, I haven't painted Woody Allen yet, but he would be another one, even though um, Woody Allen has misbehaved. But <laughs> so did Lou Reed, I'm sure. So did I. So anyway, but Lou Reed is such a great, uh, you know, I love the, I love, he, he, he just, the way he describes New York, it's urban, it's industrial, it's hard edged. He has a very, and he doesn't sugarcoat things. And I respect him for that. You know, I, I also am a person who really does listen. I'm a, I'm, I'm a good fan for any musician and, and songwriter because I care about the lyrics. I wanna know what they're saying and I wanna think about what they're saying. And he has a lot of profound things to say. And then I'm spotting someone in here you mentioned earlier. Joni. Oh, well, she's, she's the goddess to end all goddesses for sure. She's one of my biggest heroes. And Joni Mitchell, in terms of female singers, it's Joni Mitchell and Patti Smith all the way. And it's weird because they're at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Joni is refined and Patti is raw. But, you know, she, I mean, Joni just, in some ways she takes the cake. I mean, she's beautiful, she's beautiful. She's a painter. Mm -hmm. She is the quintessential female artist in my opinion, of the 20th slash 21st century. And I would like to see her win the Nobel Prize too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Nick, that's Nick Cave, who I also love. Amazing. He's more like, um, a little bit more like Lou Reed. He's very down and out and actually beautiful and poignant and sad. I mean, he's, he's lost two children and suffered a lot but he is, I just think he's a, he's a great storyteller. And again, I, you know, he's just multi-talented, a good performer too. And here we have uh, Morrissey, that's crooked on the wall. Uh, that was the first one I did and I actually need to touch that up. There's some things about that portrait. I'm not really totally finished with it yet. Um, but sometimes I have to put things on the wall and live with them until I can see you know, where it might need to be tweaked. Takes a while. So your your work is very kind of on the graphic edge. It is, I think that's also um, a that one very much so, and I think mm -hmm. that really is a product of my training at Parsons. Mm -hmm. And then tell me about this one, because this is not a portrait per se, but it is. No, it is, but it isn't. This was mm -hmm. in the show at Mary Baldwin, which um, was called, the show was called Venus Inferred. Mm -hmm. And um, so it had a lot to do with, well, for one thing, I'm a Taurus, and so, um, you know, ruled by Venus. So how could I miss that opportunity? And so it was just all about uh, different facets of the feminine. And this painting in general is sort of like the softer side of the feminine, you know, the beautiful dress that's flowing and you know with roses and fe the feminine thing and the beautiful cameos and then the texture of the silhouette which is like fur and also I did this giant book called Furline Demitas and I'm all about I love I love the furline teacup so I've done some things sort of that are a spin-off from that and that's sort of how I landed with with these and then the rabbits are sort of like the idea that women procreate and that's fascinating and sort of the you know the other thing of like the saint or the Mary figure the kind mother figure that's sort of like overseeing this whole montage mm -hmm. and then we have we have <laughs> Iggy who is like well different from Lou Reed but similar in some ways sort of how hard driving and let's see, um, loud in your face, but also so astute. I mean, people that don't give him a chance, they're missing it. Yeah, I think he's great. I mean, I wouldn't want to have his lifestyle, but I admire him so much as an artist. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but the way I painted him, he looks, it looks kind of like a piece of meat, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of fits him perfectly because he's kind of <laughs> like that. He's just visceral. 
Very visceral. I love it. <sighs> Another thing that I am looking for, and this is actually almost a spiritual principle as well, because in Taoism or even in Buddhism, you know, it's a, you want an unforced result. And of course, across disciplines, as any artist will tell you, something that looks absolutely easy and like it's just flowing, usually you'll find years and years of practice behind the scenes, like a ballet that just seems so effortless. And so actually that's also when you sort of know that you're sort of coming into your own as an artist. I mean, it's, I cannot lie, it's never not a struggle, but when it just starts to be a little bit easier and that key word unforced, so I also sort of surrender to the properties of the um, oil paint itself, which one of the beauties of oil paint is in the word oil. It is very flexible and I am also a person who is, I, I like, I'm a dancer to a degree. I mean, I didn't, I didn't study dance in school, but um, when I hold my paintbrush, I try to move not from my wrist, but from my whole arm and in this unforced, organic, easy way. And the beauty of oil paint, it will record that movement, that flowing movement, just in the most beautiful way. And you only, you get to that point when you realize, I mean, one of the most important things I would tell any artist too, is to really understand the materials that you're working with and what they can and cannot do. And that is the beauty of oil paint. It flows. Okay, so the way I start the paintings, especially the portraits, actually I've been doing this for a while and it's a, it's, it gets me excited. And it, re it relates to the house too, because I was painting the interiors of this house and I would go get to pick the color of paint on the paint swatches at Lowe's. So I could spend hours and hours looking at paint chips and I get up usually when I start a new painting, I'm thinking, oh good, I get to go choose another background color from Lowe's. And I start with house paint right on the canvas. And then I paint in oil over top of that. And, but that is the catalyst that gets me going. So are you starting with oil paint then or latex? It's house paint. Really? But I paint oil, you can paint oil over acrylic and or water-based paint, but you can't do the, opposite. do the opposite. I mean, think about it, water will be beat up and won't stick to, mm -hmm. um, you know, stick to an oil surface, but you can do it the other way. And so just make, that's decision number one in all of these paintings. Do you and, start with the same base color or do you start with different base colors? Oh, totally. I mean, I get them to mix a quart of paint for me at Lowe's. And I was painting it on with the brush, but now I'm getting smarter and I painted it with a roller. So I move, so I moved through that really fast. And then, you know, and I also, you know, use something similar to a camera obscura. I do use, um, a, what is it called? What are those things called? An LCD projector. To, so I can, and the beauty of that is I can see the image on the canvas in a way that, um, you know, so I can figure out the size and how it feels on a 48 by 36 um, canvas, you know? So I plot it, I plot it. That's how I do it. Nice. That's an earlier painting and I was thinking a lot about constellations. Oh, you might want to show, I did a, the ceiling in another room. I did constellations on the ceiling. But when I, paint, when I put the painting there, I didn't realize it, but it's kind of cool because this is a bed. And so you're sleeping right below a constellation, which I loved. I love that idea. I mean, truthfully, there have been times when I've wanted to do more installation type work and owning this house has been informed me quite a bit about that kind of work as well. So, you know, sometimes things walk the line between interior design and installation. That's awesome. So um, the question that I'm asking all of our artists, if I can remember, what makes you laugh? <laughs> the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> no. The Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. No. Let's see, what makes me laugh? I saw that question and I'm like, what am I going to tell her? <laughs> um, what 
makes me laugh. I laugh, you know, a lot. I try to laugh, try to have a sense of humor. Um, people make me laugh, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think uh, creative people like Lucille Ball, I don't know. Just, you know, I've always gravitated to funny people like Seinfeld, Lucy. These people sort of stick out in my mind as funny. And my brother makes me laugh, George, he's funny. <laughs> That's great. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to tell our audience? <laughs> Come to see us at Open Studios and support artists in the community because it's a difficult path. It's a very difficult path. And um, they need all the help and support they can get. So that's what I have to say. Awesome. So um, where can our audience find you mm. and your work? Well, you know, I, I actually sell a lot right off of Facebook, but I, I have some work over at Black Dog right now. And I have my website and I'm gonna have this exhibition at Piedmont Arts in Martinsville in November of this year. So come by the exhibition and come, come to Open Studios. Yeah, and you can find her on the Open Studios Tour Roanoke website as well, um, which uh, you can uh, find all of our artists there as well. So thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Annie, you can read the description below and find out more. And you can go to the Open Studios Tour website, which is openstudiostourroanoke.com. So we look forward to seeing you. Um, and the tour is April 29th through 30th, 2023. And it's 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. See you there. Bye.